Welcome back to the deep dive. So if you're tracking multimodal AI, especially, you know, how we train systems for text guided image editing, you definitely know the game's changed. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the latest, greatest architecture anymore. It's really about the data, the quality, the scale. It's the real bottleneck now. Absolutely. The data underneath it all. So today we're diving deep into something new from Apple authors. Uh, the paper's called Pico Banana 400K. <laughs> A large-scale data set for text-guided image editing. Right. And look, this isn't just another data set. They're talking about a whole new automated way to create this high-fidelity data. That's the core of it, yeah. I mean, we've seen amazing things from closed systems like GPT-40 and uh, Nano Banana, which, by the way, is actually the engine they used to generate the edits in this data set. Oh, okay. But, you know, for open research, it's been tougher. Past data sets, often too synthetic, you get that domain shift problem, or mm -hmm. they're just locked away, proprietary. Mm -hmm. So... Pico Banana 400K, this is basically their answer. It's huge, 400,000 examples, high quality and critically built from real images. Okay, so our mission here for you listening is the shortcut. We're gonna show you exactly how they use these powerful MLLMs, multimodal large language models. Mm -hmm. And not just for writing prompts, but actually acting as quality control judges. We'll break down the structure, some unique features for like alignment and iterative editing research. Yeah, the multi-turn stuff. Exactly. So let's just jump straight into the quick summary, the key insights you need right off the bat. Okay, here's the rundown on Pico Banana 400K in about a minute. First insight, scale and realism. We're talking a huge data set, 400,000 images, and it's all built from actual photos from the Open Images collection. That focus on real data is key to minimize that domain shift issue we see with synthetic data. And the quality check fully automated. Right? Yeah, second insight, LLM-driven quality control. Exactly. So they use Nano Banana to make the edits, but then Gemini 2.5 Pro comes in as this automated judge. It scores every single output systematically, checks for um, instruction compliance, seamlessness, preservation, technical quality. Got it. Structured. Third insight, systematic structure. Yes, very structured. To make sure they cover all bases, the data is organized using this detailed taxonomy, 35 different edit taps, covers everything from simple pixel tweaks to, you know, complex human edits and spatial layout changes. And the last bit, this is what makes it really useful for researchers, I think. Fourth insight, advanced research subsets. What? Totally. It's not just standard training data. Pico Banana includes these specialized subsets. You've got 72,000 examples for multi-turn sequences, so like two to five edits in a row on the same image. Oh, interesting. And 56,000 preference pairs. That's a successful edit paired with a failed one for the same instruction. Perfect for alignment research, things like DPO, direct preference optimization. Okay, let's unpack that systematic approach then. Starting with the, uh, the foundation. You said fidelity was key, but let's talk cost first. They mentioned around $100,000 USD. Yeah. Now, is that actually cost effective? Or does it kind of show that making this high quality labeled data is still pretty expensive, even with these powerful MLLMs helping out? That's a really good question. I think considering the scale, 400K pairs and the level of rigor they got, $100K is actually uh, very competitive, yeah. especially compared to what traditional human annotation would cost for something like this. Right. Thanks. It really validates the scalability of their automated pipeline. It shows you can replace that expensive, constant human checking with this targeted MLM evaluation. The efficiency comes from not paying people per image score, but paying for the MLLM compute time. So the compute is cheaper than the human hours. In the setup, yes. And the foundation, like you said, real photos from open images, super important. Synthetic data often has, tells, you know, artifacts, weird textures. Using real world stuff helps the models generalize better to photos users actually take. And the structure sounds pretty rigid. 35 types, eight categories, stylistic, object level, spatial. That seems vital for making sure you don't just get a data set full of easy wins, right? It forces coverage of the harder problems. Precisely. And also, what they didn't include is just as telling. They were quite strict about removing operations that current models just aren't good at yet, things that produce unreliable results. Like what specifically? Strong perspective changes or major pose rewrites for people or objects. They cut those out. Okay, hold on. Why does ditching things like changing a person's pose or the perspective matter so much? What does that tell us? Well, it speaks volumes about the current limits of diffusion models. When you ask them to do really complex structural changes, like spin a building around or make someone sit instead of stand, they often lack a solid geometric understanding, a geometric prior. So you get these weird artifacts, 
you know, melted limbs, inconsistent shading perspective that just feels wrong. To keep the training data high quality, they removed these unreliable edit types. It's basically saying to researchers, look, these are the big open challenges in geometry. We need new architectures, not just more data like this. Got it. That makes sense. So let's get into the really cool part, this LLM driven pipeline. Nano Banana makes the image, but Gemini 2.5 Pro is the gatekeeper, the automated judge. Yeah, the MLLM judge. It uses this complex system prompt, basically acting like a professional photo editor, and gives a weighted score. And the weights, they tell you their priorities. Oh, yeah? The biggest chunk, 40%, went to instruction compliance. Basically, did the model actually do what the prompt asked? That was priority number one. Wow, 40% on just compliance. That's huge. Mm. Sounds like they're really pushing for instruction following over maybe perfect visual quality, which users probably care about a lot. I think so, yeah. The other criteria then refine the visuals. Seamlessness got 25%, making sure the edit blends in naturally, no weird artifacts. Right. Then preservation balance got 20%. That's their term for ensuring stuff you didn't ask to change stays exactly the same. Super important for editing. Yeah, definitely. Don't mess up the background. Exactly. And finally, technical quality to 15%, just checking for basic sharpness, color accuracy, that kind of thing. Okay, using Gemini 2.5 Pro as the judge, though, mm. it brings up an interesting point for researchers listening. Are they training the image editor to match human taste? Or are they kind of subtly training it to match the internal preferences or limitations of another big AI model, Gemini. Is there a bias risk there? That's a really sharp point and something you always have to consider with MLLM evaluation. The authors do address it, though. They calibrated the Gemini scores against a test set verified by humans and found a strong correlation. Okay, so they checked it. Yeah. While there's always some risk of just aligning to the judge model, the fact that Gemini is evaluating the output of a different system, Nano Banana, gives some separation. They're essentially using Gemini as a very scalable proxy for human judgment, and the calibration data seems to back that up. So the score comes out, if it's above, what, 0.7, it's, it's a success, great. But the failures, you said they're important too. What happens then? The failures are actually key inputs. If an edit didn't pass the quality check, the system would automatically try again, up to three times. Uh, retries. Retries. And if one of those retries did succeed, the original failed attempt wasn't just thrown away, it was kept specifically marked as a negative example and paired with the successful one. I see. That's how they built that crucial preference upset we talked about. Yeah. The system basically curates itself, turning its own failures into valuable training data for alignment. That's clever. Yeah. Okay, what about the instructions themselves? You mentioned a dual format. Yeah, two types of instructions. The idea is to support both um, really detailed supervision for training and also instructions that look more like what a real user would type. So type I is the detailed one, the expert. Exactly. Type I, long, detailed, generated by a Gemini 2.5 flash. It acts like an expert photo editor prompt writer. It's very specific, grounded in what's actually visible in the image. Can you give an example? Sure. Instead of just make the monitor look older, a type I prompt might be something like, reshape the bulky vintage computer monitor on the desk into a slightly more streamlined, less deep CRT model while maintaining its overall screen size and reflection profile. Super detailed, great for initial supervised fine tuning, SFT. Okay, very specific. And type two. Type two is the user style. Concise, natural phrases. These were generated by a different model, Quen 2.57B Instruct, using actual human annotations as examples to learn the style. Ah, uh, learning from humans. Yeah. So this gives you short commands like, you know, move the dog closer to the fence. The model then has to learn how to take that simple intent and figure out the complex steps needed to execute it properly. It bridges that gap. Makes sense. And looking at the data itself, figure three in the paper shows the distribution. It seems pretty broad. Animals are the most common target at 23%. People next at nearly 20%. Buildings around 9.5% feels like good coverage. Yeah, that diversity is important for making sure the models can generalize well. Okay, let's talk about those specialized subsets again. They seem like the real engine for future research here. Out of the, what, 386,000 total examples, mm -hmm. about two-thirds are that single-turn SFT data. Right, 66.8%. But that last third... That's the interesting stuff. That's the research fuel, yeah. Take the preference subset, 56,000 pairs. If you're doing alignment work, DPO, reward modeling, this is gold. Why gold? Because it gives such a clear signal. For this exact instruction, this output is good and this output is bad. There's an example in the paper, relocating striped straws into milk glasses. One edit gets it right, perfect geometry. 
the paired failure messes up the straws, placement is wrong. A uh, direct contrast. Exactly. That high contrast signal is what models need to learn fine-grained fidelity to understand why one version failed and the other succeeded. And the other subset, the multi-turn one. Yeah. 72,000 examples. This is for sequences of edits, right? Yes. Two to five edits in a row, all on the same starting image. This is huge for testing iterative refinement, planning, things that are much more complex than just one-shot editing. How do they handle the instructions for that? Does it get complicated? Gemini 2.5 Pro generated these two, and they specifically prompted it to use referential language, coreference. Meaning? Meaning, if the first edit adds, say, a cat, the second instruction might say, make it blue, where it clearly refers back to the cat that was just added. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a big leap. It's not just do X. It's do X. Now remember X and do Y to X. The model needs memory context. Precisely. The paper had that great pumpkin example. Start with a pumpkin photo. Step one, apply a vintage filter. Step two, change the background to on a house. Step three, add snow on the ground. Step four, adjust the lighting to golden hour. Four steps, all building on each other. Exactly. Sequential dependent steps. Requires preserving the state across edits. Without multi-turn data like this, it's really hard to benchmark if a model can actually handle that kind of compositional task. So stepping back, what is this whole data set and the way they evaluated it using Gemini? Tell us about where text-to-image editing models are now. They benchmarked Nano Banana using this system. Yeah, they did. And the results, shown in their figure six, paint a pretty clear picture. Global stuff. Easy. Appearance changes, artistic styles. Models are really good at that. Like high success rate for style transfer, you mentioned. Right, like strong artistic style transfer hit a 0.93 success rate. These edits don't need super precise spatial reasoning. They're kind of global changes in the latent space. The hard stuff. Still hard. Anything requiring precise geometry, layout control, or getting symbols right, that's where current models struggle. The data clearly shows the failure modes. What were the lowest scores? The absolute lowest was change font style or color of visible text, only about 0.57 success. Hmm. Just over half the time it worked. Relocate an object was also really low, around 0.59. Wow, less than 60% success for just moving something. Yeah, and even human stylizations, if they involve big exaggerations, like making a portrait into a Pixar character or a caricature, those struggled too, around 0.58 to 0.64 success. You often see the identity drifts or the shading looks wrong, things the model can't quite control locally. So the takeaway for researchers seems pretty stark. We're good at making things look generally different aesthetically, but terrible at precise spatial control and things like text. That's basically it. The failures are screaming for better ways to condition the models spatially. We need training objectives that understand geometry better and maybe ways to specify regions more precisely than just text prompts can allow. And Pico Banana 400K seems positioned to help drive that research. How does it stack up against other data sets people might know, like GIR or Magic Brush? Its main advantages are the use of real images, which helps with generalization, and crucially, those unique preference and multi-turn subsets. Those allow research into instruction, faithfulness, and content preservation in complex sequential tasks in a way other datasets don't quite support as well. So wrapping up, this combination, Nano Banana generating Gemini 2.5 Pro judging, feels like a really a significant step forward for creating these large, high-quality datasets scalably. It lets you get that rigorous curation without needing humans to look at every single one of 400,000 images. It's definitely a powerful framework. My final sort of provocative thought for you, the listener, to, to chew on is this. We see these models excel at global style changes, but really fall down on precise geometry, like moving an object accurately or handling text. Does relying purely on text instructions fundamentally limit how well these models can ever master that kind of non-semantic spatial precision. What else do we need? What kind of non-textual inputs, maybe sketches, maybe bounding boxes, maybe those region referential prompts the paper mentions are gonna be necessary to unlock true mastery of local geometric editing? That feels like the big question for the next wave of multimodal research. Yeah. Something to think about. For anyone who wants to dive into the data themselves, the great news is the code and metadata are public. Yep, available on GitHub. You can find the link, uh, usually in the description or show notes. Thanks so much for diving deep with us today. We'll catch you on the next deep dive.